So we've been looking at rigid body kinetics for the last couple of meetings. And uh, specifically for those meetings, we've looked at some cases where there was pure rotation about a given axis, and we've looked at some cases where there was pure translation. And in both cases, uh, we had a, you know, probably different set of equations that we wound up using in those uh, scenarios. Today, we're going to put it all together. So we're going to talk about bodies that move in plane still. So we're not actually expanding out yet to 3D. We're still talking about 2D problems, uh, which, by the way, that actually covers a pretty wide universe of possibilities. There are a lot of problems that can be expressed as in plane problems. So we shouldn't feel like this is overly limiting us. Um, but we're going to look at the case where we can consider both translation and rotation simultaneously. And so really about the only background theory that we probably need to touch on here is just remember, you know, for some body, we don't care what shape it is. That's, you know, you're probably familiar in engineering. A lot of times you'll see an engineering professor draw a blob, right? What we're trying to say whenever we draw a blob like this is it doesn't matter what the shape is. You know, you just might need to know a couple of things about it. So let's say that you know where the center of gravity might be for the blob. And uh, you also might know a number of forces that are applied to the blob. You might know exactly where those forces are applied and how. So that doesn't necessarily really matter. It can be any number of forces acting on there. Um, and there can also be things like, you know, even you know, concentrated moments or couples can be applied to this thing too. So there can be any number of these various forces and moments, you know, this kind of thing. And under the influence of all of these different forces that are applied to the body, uh, two different things can happen. One is the body can accelerate angularly, right? So it might have this tendency to begin accelerating angularly, all right? And it also has the possibility that the center of gravity could begin to accelerate in a particular direction. So, you know, I'm not trying to be specific with the specific directions of these, but um, there could be an acceleration vector like this as well, okay? So what I just said a second ago is we've looked at cases now where we had uh, like pivoting about a fixed axis, and we've looked at cases where we had some sort of pure translation. What we're gonna look at now is the possibility of both of these happening at the same time. And when they do, uh, keep in mind, these are our equations. If we add up all of our force vectors, it's going to be equal to the mass of the body times the acceleration vector. Okay, so essentially if you find the resultant of all of the applied forces, it's going to equal the mass of the body times the linear acceleration vector. Okay, but then the other part that we had is a little bit more tricky. Uh, one thing that we can say is that if we sum moments about the center of gravity, then the result is going to be the uh, moment of inertia, the mass moment of inertia, around the center of gravity times the angular acceleration of the body. So that's actually simple enough there. We made it a little more complicated by considering the idea of what if we want to sum moments around some other point that is not the center of gravity. Let's just say there's some other point P over here, okay? I don't care where it is per se, but uh, we take the, if we want to take the sum of moments around that other point P, uh, we can figure that out as well, but what we have to do is first take the moment of inertia about the center of gravity times alpha, and then add onto it the uh, kinetic moment term. And then we spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out what that kinetic moment term was. Uh, basically, what it amounts to is we have to look at the acceleration, okay? We have to look at the acceleration of the um, center of gravity of this thing, and, you know, to that, we have to multiply, that's, you know, that's the acceleration of the center of gravity, same thing as I had up here, so acceleration of the center of gravity. To this, we have to 
uh, multiply m, first of all, and then we have to cross a vector r of, uh, you know, a vector that goes from g to p. All right. So that's a little bit more formal than when I did it last time, or it's a little bit more formal notation because I'm using those vectors there. But it's still the same idea. You just have to look at, uh, basically, the other way of thinking about that is it's the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the acceleration vector um, to the point that you're summing moments about, because that's basically the same uh, type of construction that we would use to, to construct any kind of a moment. All right, so that's basically it. We can use any or all of these relationships uh, whenever we're doing these general plane motion problems. And so what we want to do is go ahead and cover a couple of these problems and kind of see by example how we might apply these different equations. All right, so here's the first one. Let's say I have a 50 kilogram rod. Initially, it's being held here by a couple of ropes, one going from A to B and one going from D to E. Um, those ropes, we, we're gonna neglect the mass for right now. So let's say that rope AB suddenly breaks. And once a, rope AB suddenly breaks, uh, right at that point in time, the rod will begin to accelerate. Uh, it can accelerate both angularly and linearly at the same time. So we want to figure out uh, both the linear acceleration of these points and the angular acceleration of the rod, as well as the tension in rope DE. Okay? Where do you think a good place to start might be? All right, how about um, doing a free body diagram? That sound good? So we'll start with our free body diagram here. And for our free body diagram, there's not a huge need that we need to make it, uh, I guess, you know, really realistic or anything like that. Let's just make it look like a line. Okay. And that represents rod BCD. All right. Now, what sorts of forces are applied to rod BCD? Okay, where C is this center right here. Okay, B, C, D. What kind of forces get applied to this rod? Okay, one that's easy is the weight. Okay, the weight of this thing is just 50 kilograms times 9.81 meter per second squared. Mg. Okay. So one thing I should say is we're looking at the instant in time where rope AB suddenly breaks. Okay. So right here at this instant. At this instant, the piece has had no time to move. All that has happened is you know, like if you were to put a really slow motion camera on this, right when rope AB broke, there wouldn't be any instantaneous motion of BCD. It would stay right there, right when it broke, and then it would begin to move, right? So that's why we can assume that it stays horizontal eat this instant right after that rope breaks. Okay, what other force might we see on here? Okay, I would say we still have this rope uh, right here connected, and I'll call that maybe FDE. Okay, that's the force in that rope that moves up like that. Um, anything that I know about that force? Okay, it's a rope, so we actually know that the force has to be directed along a line that is the axis of the rope. Okay, the rope can't carry any other kind of a force in it. And so, given that, I know the slope of it because I know the geometry uh, that's given there. So it has a rise of four for a run of three. All right. 
Anything else? Well, let's do this. Let's add a set of axes. Okay, I have x here, I have y here, just to be explicit about the directions I'm, I'm going to be taking there. All right, I think that's about it for that diagram. What's the other diagram we often do? In dynamics, especially. Okay, the other one we, we often like to do is called a kinetic diagram. Okay, what we do on the kinetic diagram is we try to specify anything that we know about how it begins to move. Okay, so probably the most interesting thing for us to look at on this diagram is point D. All right, that's where we know the most information. I have no reason to think that rope uh, DE will go slack. All right. As long as DE does not go slack, uh, then I can assume that the direction that point D begins to accelerate um, is going to be normal to the direction of the rope. Okay, so it, it's going to be something like this. And I could call that AD. Okay, and if it's normal to the direction of the rope, what else can I say? Like, what else can I draw on this diagram that really tells me the direction that that point will begin to accelerate? Okay, if that is perpendicular, that acceleration is perpendicular to the direction of the rope, it means that the slope is related by the reciprocal, right? Where I can basically swap rise and run. So if I had the run, uh, I'm going to put it on the rise. And if I had the rise, I'm going to put it on the run. Okay. Now you might say to me, I don't think that that's complete as far as the, um, you know, the acceleration of point D. The reason you might, you know, and that you have a valid reason why you might think that. What if point D actually had some velocity to it? Okay. If point D had some velocity to it, then we would have to say that there could also be an acceleration normal to toward E, right? So that we could, we could say, is there this normal component Okay, and I'll put a question mark on there. For our case, again, we're, we're looking very narrowly at this instant in time, right when we clip the rope or right when the rope breaks. Will we have any normal acceleration for rope DE? Okay. How would you answer, like, what would you need to know in order to answer that question? Well, let's think about what the equation would be for normal acceleration. We have a couple of different ones that we use on occasion. One is omega squared R. Okay. So the question here is, does my rope DE, or really, I guess, does point D have any angular velocity around point E at this instant in time. And we have to go back to what I said just a minute ago. Right at the instant that you break the rope, literally right at that point in time, there hasn't been enough time yet for there to be any velocity that has accrued. Okay. Now, velocity will start to happen, right? It will start to pick up speed. But right there at that instant, there is still no angular velocity. Or the other, you know, I guess I should probably say the other uh, place where we've seen something like a normal acceleration has been uh, v squared over rho. Same thing, really. It's just now you're thinking about does point D have any linear velocity at this point in time? Same, it's the same principle, right? It's no, you don't because you don't have any, uh, you haven't had any time to let point D begin to move, okay? So all of that to say, no, we don't have any of this. We have a pure acceleration for point D uh, that would be in sort of that tangential direction to where the rope is allowing it to swing. All right, so far so good. What else? What else do you think might be helpful for me to put on here? OK. 
Okay. Well, how about if I actually go ahead and label my uh, accelerations of the center of gravity? Because that's something that I might end up wanting to use, right? So we'll put on here. Um, not much else I can do besides just put them on here and label them. But let's say that I say this is acceleration of point C in the X direction, and this is the acceleration of point C in the Y direction. That's probably about as, as good as I can do right now. All right. What other sort of kinematic or kinetic quanti quantity do you think I might want here? might be helpful if I also established that there's this angular acceleration that happens around the CG. And I'll just call that alpha. Okay. All right, a couple other things I'll put on both diagrams. Um, we know that the length of the rod is 10 meters, which means this is five meters and five meters. Okay, same thing over here. Maybe I'll do it down like this. All right, and I'll go ahead and explicitly establish my coordinates here as well. So there's Y, there's X. All right, so now what we can do is start establishing our equations of motion, all right? So the first one that I'll put on here is, uh, let's say, a sum of moments. And for my first example here, why don't we just use a sum of moments around the CG, okay? That way we don't have to deal with any kinetic moments. Let me take counterclockwise to be positive. All right. So what kind of forces do I have that create these moments around point? Uh, maybe I'll actually use C here instead of G, right? Same idea, because point C is at the center of gravity. Okay. So what forces do I have that will create moments around point C? The weight will not, because the weight's line of action passes through point C. But I do have the force that's in the rope, DE, and it will have a tendency to try to create a, a rotational effect around point C. So I will take that FDE. If you look at it, not the entire force, really only the vertical component is needed to figure out what that tendency to rotate is around point C. So to pick off just the vertical component, what I'll do is I'll take the rise over the length of the hypotenuse And by multiplying by that quantity right there, it allows me to pick off just the vertical component of FDE. But that's not quite enough either, because I need to multiply it by a length. And that length will be five meters, because it's five meters from point D to point C. All right. Now, what is this going to be equal to? Okay, well, it's going to be equal to I, all right? I is the moment of inertia. Okay, how do I calculate moment of inertia? If you haven't memorized these yet, that's okay, because this is information that's given to you. I'm going to treat this like a slender rod, all right? And your slender rod, uh, based on the little table of various moments of inertia, your slender rod has a... Uh, formula to, to find what it is around its center of 1 12th mass times length squared. Okay, so 1 12th of the mass times the length squared. Okay, that term that I just wrote right there is I sub G that I mentioned a few seconds ago, okay? That's I sub G. What do I multiply that by? 
alpha. All right, and that's an equation that has two unknowns in it, so I can't really do anything with it just yet, so I'll leave it alone for right now. Um, what, what's the equation you think I might want to try next? How about summing forces in the x? Oops, in the x, I've got the x component of FDE. To get just the x component, I would multiply by, by the way, what is the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared? Okay, chose these. For this one here, we're picking off the vertical component of FDE because the vertical component is the one that would create a moment around point C, right? See how that's the, the piece that is naturally perpendicular using that length of five uh, meters? Yeah, so over here, the reason that those are swapped is that this is actually a perpendicular direction. A AD has a perpendicular direction to the direction of FDE. And in order to represent that properly on these diagrams, uh, you swap rise and run, and that indicates that the two are perpendicular to each other. If you remember back to algebra, you may have learned that whenever you had lines that were perpendicular to each other, their slopes were negative reciprocals of one another. So that's that principle at work right there. All right, so here, rather than write that uh, square root all the time, I'm just going to divide by five. Okay, for FDE picking off the horizontal component. Anything else I need to do for my sum of forces in the X? Okay, I would say no, not really. I don't have any other X components of force. So now I need to write the other side of the equation. Okay, the other side of the equation says that I take the mass of the rod and multiply by the acceleration of the center of gravity. All right, that equation also has two variables and I've actually introduced another one. So the set of two equations I have right now between the two of them, I've got three unknowns. So I still can't do anything just yet. All right, so let me do the Y equation. Okay, for the y equation, um, I am going to take um, FDE times 4 over 5. That picks off the vertical component of FDE. And I'm going to subtract from it the weight. Okay. Those are my vertical components of force I have acting on rod BCD. What do I set this equal to? Okay, not a trick question. Just 50 kilograms times ACY. So now I've introduced one more equation, but unfortunately I've also introduced one more variable. All right, so is that any good? Okay, so right now I've got three equations. I have four unknowns. What do I do now? Okay, could I sum moments around point D? So here's the issue with that. Uh, when you're summing moments, or actually when you're doing any, any math like this where you're doing a system of equations, each physical principle that you plan on using, you can only use once. 
if you use a, a, single print, single, uh, a single physical principle more than once, what will happen is you will end up creating an equation that's not actually independent of the others. Okay, so yes, we could technically write an equation like that, but it would not technically help us, right? And the reason why is it would end up not giving us anything that we don't already know. All right? So, what do you think we should do? Any thoughts? What's a variable that's conspicuously absent in what I have written so far? I have one variable that I wrote on my kinetic diagram up there that did not show up yet in my equations. Which one? AD, right? The acceleration of point D. I know some stuff about that. And it's stuff that I actually need to be introduced into the problem somehow in order for it to make physical sense, right? to know the direction that point D will begin to accelerate is actually an important thing. It's what changes the problem from being one where the, the rod would just fall to one where the rod swings, right? So that's an important thing that I need to have in this, uh, in this problem somehow. And so here's how I would end up getting it introduced, okay? Remember, we have these equations that actually allow us to relate, have relative accelerations within a rigid body. Do you remember those equations? So like, I could write this thing that says the acceleration of point C is equal to the acceleration of point D, then what? Plus the alpha vector crossed into the relative, um, position vector R of D with respect to C <clears throat> and really I think I, I think I've got that backwards C relative to D sorry about that I wrote it wrong in my notes all right and then I'd have to subtract off Omega squared times that vector R of C relative to D. Okay, well, so what? Well, this is actually, there's, there's a lot we can get out of this. So one of the things we can see immediately is that again, because we're looking at this snapshot in time, right when we clip rope AB, it means we've had no time yet for, the, for us to generate any angular velocity of the rod. So right here at this instant, this angular velocity is zero. Okay, if you let this problem go for a finite period of time, that would no longer be true. You would actually have some angular velocity if you let it start moving. Uh, but since, the, since it's right here at this instant, we can do that. Okay, what about alpha cross R of C relative to D. You remember, you know, we, we did something that actually let us get that um, if we were talking about an in-plane problem, right? Um, alpha crossed R, this is kind of a sidebar right here. Alpha cross R um, is what? Okay, what we did is we said we had negative alpha times r y i plus alpha times r x j. This is for in plane motion, which is what we have. Okay, well how does that help us? Okay, here's how it helps us. The acceleration of C in the X direction becomes the acceleration of D in the X direction plus what? Technically, I guess it's minus, right? Minus 
alpha, because I'm going right up here, uh, alpha times ry times i. We don't need the i because now we're focusing just on the x direction. Okay? Well, what would this look like for our actual problem? ACX becomes, do I, can I take ADX and uh, express it in terms of my entire AD? I would say, yes, I can, right? ADX just becomes AD times, I'm, I need just the horizontal component there, so I multiply it by four over the square root of three squared plus four squared, which is just five. Okay, so that by multiplying AD by four over five, I'm picking off just the X component of AD. All right, then what? Minus alpha, what is RY? RY, keep, keep in mind, the R that I'm talking about here is going from C from D to C, I should be careful with this, from D to C, okay? That's what this C relative to D, it means that I'm looking at this vector that goes, that starts at D and goes to C, like this. Okay? So what would that, what would the Y component be for that vector? Zero. Okay, so that basically just tells me that ACX is equal to AD times four-fifths. Well, can I do this same thing for the Y? Okay, be ADY plus alpha times RX. For our problem, ACY is going to be equal to AD. times three. And actually, should I be positive or negative here? AD points downward, right? So I say minus AD. Times three-fifths, okay? Plus alpha times what? Okay, Rx, this is again going from D to C. If I go from D to C, that is a change in location of negative five meters along the X direction. All right, so now, Look at what we've done here. I have introduced one more variable. I introduced AD, but I created two more equations, right? The one new variable that I introduced by creating those two equations is just AD. So we're now in a good place to where we can solve this problem. And it's actually not that hard to do a couple of substitutions because I have ACX and ACY pretty isolated in uh, all of my equations. So I'm basically just going to do that substitution, figure out, um, you know, how to get it down into a three by three to be able to solve it fairly easily. All right. So the first equation is just my moment equation and it doesn't have to change. It's just FDE. Tell you what, I'll actually pull uh, the term on the right side over to the left side, but I'll have FDE times four over five times five meters. So I'm basically starting, I'm rewriting all my equations starting with the one up here. Okay, so that's this one right here. All right, I'll subtract um, 50 kilograms times 10 meters squared over 12 alpha is equal to zero. That one really didn't change at all. The next one I need to substitute in for ACX. 
So for this next one, I have FDE times three fifths. Okay. Uh, let me pull uh, this term over to the left side. Okay. So I would have minus 50 kilograms times, and I'm going to sub in what I have for ACX. Okay. So what I have there is AD times four fifths. Okay. Minus, okay, I actually don't need that other one, right? Alpha is just multiplied by zero. All right, and this is going to be equal to zero. All right, so then my last equation that I've got here is going to be FDE times four fifths. minus 50 kilograms times, let's see, 9.81, tell you what, I'm going to move that to the other side of the expression. So I'm actually going to go ahead and get my 50 kilograms times ACY. ACY is going to be equal to minus AD times 3 fifths plus alpha times minus five meters. Okay, and then I'll slide that 50 kilograms times 9.81 meter per second squared over here. Okay, and check me on that, make sure I didn't make any errors there. But once we set up that system of equations, uh, you'll notice there that is just a three by three set of linear uh, equations and we can solve for each of the values there, okay? And because you've seen me do that a whole lot, uh, tell you what, I'll go ahead also and kind of give you where each of these equations came from. That was this one right here and this one goes to this right here. All right, I'll just give you the answers. When you solve this, FDE becomes 134.38 uh, Newtons. The acceleration of point D uh, is going to be 2.016 meter per second squared. And alpha is going to be equal to 1.29 radian per second squared. All right. Well, what if I wanted to know what the acceleration was of my center of gravity, right? That was one of the things. I tell you what, we're actually going to drop uh, for today. I want to get through some stuff, so I'm going to scratch off uh, finding point B. But we'll find point C and D. How would you do point B if you had to? Okay. Could you set up a similar kind of equation or, you know, types of equations like I did right here for point B. Could you do that in terms of the acceleration of D and alpha and the vector from D to B? I would say you probably could, right? And that's how you would get the acceleration of point B. For us, let's just go ahead and get the acceleration of point C, okay? So, Acceleration of point C, we get that by first looking in the X. We have acceleration of D, 2.016 meter per second squared times four fifths. Okay, 
So that gives me 1.613 meter per second squared. And in the y, I've got, okay, that comes from the second equation up here, minus AD, okay, AD is 2.016 meter per second squared, okay, times three-fifths. And then adding to that alpha, 1.29 radian per second squared, times minus five meters. Okay, so if I punch those in, what it'll end up giving me is uh, 7.66, negative 7.66 meter per second squared. All right. So when I'm trying to specify what the velocity, or excuse me, what the acceleration is of a particular point, I can do that in vector form. Acceleration at point C is going to be equal to 1.613 I minus 7.66 J meter per second squared. All right, and one of the other things that is often of interest is what is the magnitude, okay? The magnitude of that vector can be found here by taking the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. Like so. And if you punch those in, it ends up giving you 7.828 meter per second squared. So when someone asks you for the acceleration of a particular point, it's not always clear exactly what they mean, you know, whenever they say that. Um, it could be either one of these. They might want to know what's the acceleration vector. They might want to know what's the magnitude of the acceleration in a more absolute sense. All right, any questions on this problem? Did that one look tough when we first looked at it? Okay. So I get a couple of uh, nods, a couple of shakings of heads. All right. Not too bad. Turns out it's, it's not that hard to solve.